Now the thing with uh, forgiveness is you will see that you have an attachment to either yourself or someone else. And that attachment can be quite strong. And you have a memory of something somebody did that um, you didn't really like very much. I mean, it could be a very violent thing or it could be a very heavy emotional thing. It doesn't really matter what it is. That's the content. What your job is, is to forgive that person for causing you pain. You forgive yourself for causing yourself pain. You forgive somebody else for causing you pain. And you hear them say back to you, I forgive you too. And that's how you let go. That's how you let go of these old attachments. And every time you do that, you will feel a sense of relief. Ah, all right. And you don't have any hard feelings towards that person. Now, there was one lady that came to me and she had been raped. And she really, really had a very big dislike and anger towards the person that did it to her. So she worked with it for a period of days. I don't remember exactly. Uh, it was like two weeks or something. And she finally was able to forgive him. And she said, what happens if I see him again? I said, you're not going to run up and give him a hug. But you can avoid. So something like that won't even happen again. But you don't need to hate that person, hate the act. But let go of the hatred. So you're letting go of your attachment to that person. And when you do that, it clears your mind up very, very much. Not just a little bit. Your mind becomes super clear. And you know what is the right action to take when you get in a situation. So this is how you overcome sadness. This is how you overcome depression. This is how you overcome fear and hatred and anxiety is by forgiving and allowing that person to be. I was talking, when was it, last night? About couples. You're always like that. You want to keep them acting in the same way over and over and over again? You hold that image of them always being that way. And they will not uh, disappoint you. They will act that way. But when you forgive them, you're giving them the space to act differently. You're not holding them like they're, they were in a diamond or something. And they couldn't move. When you forgive them and allow that person to be able to act in a more natural way, then there's more harmony in with you and with the other person. And that harmony starts to spread out, not only with 
you two, you're as a couple, but that harmony starts to spread out to kids and it starts to spread out to other people around you. What you think and ponder on, that's the inclination of your mind, right? If you think and ponder on how this person always acts this way and how you, you really don't like it, well, your mind is thinking and pondering on them being that way and they will really be that way. But when you start to relax your thinking about them and you start having a mind that has more equanimity in it, this is what loving kindness leads to. This is what forgiveness leads to. And loving kindness and forgiveness are just different aspects of the same thing. Okay? Loving kindness is, is a softening of your personality. Forgiveness, when you actually forgive, there's a softening of the personality. And there's more spaciousness in your mind. And that's the whole point of doing uh, the forgiveness meditation. Now, I did this for a couple of years because I wanted to delve in and really understand what loving kindness and uh, forgiveness was all about. And when my father died, I was 13 years old. And I was his favorite. Of all my brothers, I was his favorite. And I knew I was his favorite. And he would do things like he had to travel on his job and he would take me out of school so I could travel with him. So when he died, I was angry at him for leaving. Now, isn't that odd to be angry at somebody because they did something that was out of their own control? And I held on to that. And that, that anger turned into a lot of sadness and depression and all kinds of really unwholesome, unpleasant things coming up in my mind as I was growing up as a teenager. And I held on to that anger and dissatisfaction for a long time until I started forgiving. And then I started seeing the sense of, well, it wasn't his fault. Why should I be angry at him? Where does this anger come from? Why does it arise? Don't really need to have it around anymore. But I was attached because those are the thoughts that came up first right as he died. I didn't like that situation. I didn't want to be around that situation. And I was angry because he wasn't going to be able to raise me in the hardest part of being a human being, being a teenager. He wasn't going to be around. And I missed him incredibly. So I had to forgive him for all of that. And was I forgiving him? Not really. I was forgiving myself. And then that softens your personality. And you start to have a more accepting mind of being around those kind of situations. So as I grew up and I started being an adult, I started seeing the importance of being around people when they died so that they could die with a happy, uplifted mind. And there's a thing in, uh, in Buddhism that's called the five visions of the afterlife. 
and you, a lot of people, not everyone, but almost everyone, has a vision right before they die. And their last thought is the, the thing that uh, says what uh, realm they're going to be reborn in. Okay. Uh, if somebody has a dissatisfaction thought as they're dying, the dislike thought, then they're probably going to be reborn in a hell realm. And it's going to last for a little period of time, however long. And then they'll be reborn into another realm and they'll, they'll stay on the wheel of Sansara. Now, sometimes people have a thought of material things. They had to have some greed in their mind. Like there was uh, uh, in, in India, Bangladesh, there was a man, and their custom is that uh, they, when they die on this mattress that gets cremated with them. And it was a brand new mattress. And this man had a thought about that, wanting to be pulled off of that mattress and put on an old one so that his family could uh, have this other mattress. And he saw um, a real scary, black, hairy being. And he was starting to, he, he grabbed this guy's legs and he was starting to pull him away in, in this man's mind. Now my friend was with him and he saw that that's what was happening. And he started encouraging that the man start thinking about the Buddha Dhamma Th Sangha, because he was a Buddhist. And he started thinking about uh, the precepts and keeping the precepts and that vision would, went away. So that's a, one of the advantages of being with people as they die when you talk to them and they see uh, these different kinds of vision. There are some people that have this idea of uh, wanting to go to the, like the American Indians, the happy hunting grounds. And being with animals and that sort of thing. And if they have a vision of animals, they'll re be reborn as an animal. And when they're reborn as an animal, it takes a long, long time to get out of that. They keep being reborn as an animal over and over again. And this is another thing that, uh, that happens for quite a few people. If they have a vision of their past family members, that means they're going to be reborn in the human realm. But my friend, that, that he wrote this book about it, and what he tried to do was he would keep chanting and, and uh, getting this person to recite, recite the uh, precepts, even if they didn't have enough energy to actually recite them, to recite them in his mind. And then he started having visions of heavenly beings coming down in a chariot to take them away. And I thought that was real interesting, that whole, that whole scenario, and I didn't believe it blindly. Okay, the Buddha said it, prove it, I want to see this stuff. So I went and I started working at my mother's nursing home. And I was with uh, a lady that had a, a disease where her brain was shrinking and she'd lost her memory. And I spent every day with her 
trying to get her to remember happy times and get her to talk about uh, pleasant things that she'd done and how she helped other people and that sort of thing. But while I was there, I had the opportunity to be with a few, not a whole lot, but a few uh, people as they were dying. And I, uh, my mother ran the nursing home, which was very fortunate for me. And uh, she would tell me that this person is going to die in the next two or three days. So I would spend a lot of time with them. And they were Christians, so I was reading from the Bible. I'm not trying to convert anybody to anything. If that's what they're comfortable with, then that's a good thing for them to listen to. And I happened to find in the book of Matthew, I don't remember exactly where it is anymore, but there was the rest of the, the, the writing of the precepts. So I would tell them, okay, this, I, I didn't want to shake them up. I didn't never told them I was a Buddhist. I say, this is from the Bible and this is what this says. Can you repeat that in your mind? And they, they would their, mind, their minds would become very peaceful and very calm. And when they died, the, quite often, they died with a little smile on their face. And I thought that was a good thing to do. Now going from having this horrible experience of my father dying when I was 13 years old and being alone and afraid and so caught up in my own emotional dissatisfaction. And I had that until I started doing the forgiveness. And after I did the forgiveness, then I started spending more time with people as they were dying because I understood more what was going through their minds. And some people, they, they really, uh, I, I started working with a hospice and I, I was with this man as he was starting to die and he started talking about this real scary being that was starting to pull him away. And I recognized that that was because he had some uh, sensual desire and uh, greed in his mind for something. And then I would get them to start reciting the, uh, the precepts. And then that vision would go away and then he would be very peaceful and calm for a period of time. And when he died, he was completely accepting of the fact of dying. And he was quite content and had this angelic look on his face when he died. It was really kind of inspiring. As if you can say that, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I still had that old baggage those old attachments of fear and sadness and anxiety and, and dislike and the hatred of that whole situation. I wouldn't have been able to been clear enough to help. So the forgiveness meditation is a very powerful meditation and it is very necessary what I found is to carry it with you all the time. And when somebody says something that your mind grabs onto and says, I don't like that, then you start forgiving that person right then. Forgiving yourself for your mind being crazy and doing that kind of thing. It's okay to be crazy because we all are. So, 
the more you can relax into and forgive as much as possible during the day, that starts changing your perspective of everything. So you start having more balance in your mind. You don't get knocked off balance by your emotional upsets because you've already let go of the cause of the emotional upsets. So it's a real important aspect to do the forgiveness. And when you're walking, don't let your mind ho-hum around. Stay with your object of meditation. Stay with, on your right foot, in your mind you say, I. On your left foot, forgive. On your right foot, myself. I forgive you. I forgive myself. I forgive you. Now the whole thing with a lot of the Buddha's practice is to take the unwholesome and make it wholesome. And you need to develop practicing the forgiveness whenever you need it. And it'll put you through some changes. You'll remember things that happened that were, well, they might have happened when they were four or five years old. I stole something. Or I said something that wasn't true. And then you can forgive that. You don't have to hold that guilt anymore. So it's a real important aspect of loving kindness to have that forgiveness and practice it if you need it. Okay? Now, if you're going to do that, you have to make a determination not to go any higher than the first jhana. Because if you've done other meditation, your mind will have a tendency to go deep into the meditation and you lose the forgiveness. And then you, you, you don't really have an object to meditation, so you <coughs> need, need to make that determination to go no higher than the first jhana because you need the verbalization. You need to say, I forgive myself for not understanding. I forgive myself for making mistakes. Now we are our own hardest critic and we have to stop doing that. And that leads to happiness. That leads to well-being. It leads to a much lighter mind. And for some people that, that have done a lot of meditation in the past, because they've already developed their concentration, they can stay with the forgiveness for longer periods of time, and that's good not trying to progress with any of that, but uh, the longer you can stay with the forgiveness and, for, and truly forgive yourself for not being perfect and f forgive yourself for making mistakes, then your mind becomes softer. And you'll get to a place where your mind says, I don't need to do this anymore. So, okay, then go back to your loving kindness. You can do that. Love, uh, the forgiveness meditation is the most powerful meditation that I know because it cuts out all of these old thoughts and feelings of this is me, this is mine, I did this. 
cuts those away. I say cuts, that's kind of a harsh word. It takes them away. And it helps your mind become more settled and at ease. So when hindrances do come, and they will, it's much easier to let go of them. You say, well, if I forgive everything and my mind says, I don't need to do that anymore, that doesn't mean forever and ever, amen. Because how many lifetimes have we lived and caused ourselves so much pain and suffering and other people around us? And there might be some of that coming up now. So you don't need to know what it is necessarily. You just have to keep forgiving. And forgive during your daily activities. And any time your mind gets tight with dissatisfaction or dislike, don't react like you always act. Respond by forgiving. I had no idea I was going to be doing that tonight. <laughs> Ay, yo. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's really kind of interesting. I gave a talk on forgiveness to about, oh, I must have been three or four hundred Thai people in Chicago. And very few of them even came, and they all spoke good English. They, came, they didn't even come close to understanding what I was saying. Because they, they have this philosophy of never mind. Oh, you said this, you did this, never mind. Like they don't hold on to it in their mind. And that philosophy has actually hurt a lot of people because they're still holding on to their attachment. They're not letting it go. Anyway. <clears throat> it is a wonderful meditation to um, help clear things out. And if you feel like you don't need to do it right now, don't. If you... Your meditation is going good and you're starting to go deep and you don't feel in, in any emotional stuff coming up and you can just continue on because your mind is getting pure every time you use the six R's. And that might take some of that old attachment away before it even has a chance to come up. So it's a real important practice and use it skillfully. There's a lot of uh, New Age words that I kind of back away from. Uh, and a letting it be is one of them. If you don't, if you let it be and you don't relax the tightness caused by that distraction, you're not helping yourself with your meditation and you're not allowing the space for yourself to change. And this is a big one. This is really a big one. Buddhism is about change. It's about you learning how to allow the space for yourself to change and become more happy, more in balance with everything, more settled. 